morning as we continue our time of worship, as we, we worship through the preaching and teaching of the word, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it. Device, smartphone, tablet, that's fine too. It's going to be up on the screens, and if, you, if you'd like, anybody in the room that would like a Bible, the translation that I preach and teach from... Uh, we have some on our welcome table, so anyone is welcome to grab one of those, anyone that would like one. Um, please feel free to take one whenever you like. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through 12. It says, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I just, um, God, as we open your word today, Lord, I pray that uh, we would be faithful to what it says, that we would be faithful to its teaching, its meaning, its understanding, and its application in our lives. God, I pray that, pray that we would clearly understand the word today and that each of us would be changed, not by, God, not by anything I say, but by the power of your spirit through your word. It's in Jesus' name. This is a text of scripture known as the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes. It's, it's from a Latin word that means um, um, joy or bliss um, or blessed from the, from the Latin word bliss. And, and the main idea I want us to consider as we look at the Beatitudes is that Jesus changes everything. Like I really like simple and easy. I think it's it's much easier to communicate in complex words and phrases and big stuff, but if you can take things that are that are complex and robust and boil them down to like, Jesus changes everything. I mean, that's how I think um, 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 it's best to communicate. So that's how I try to do it. I try to boil things down. Let's bottom line it today. And the bottom line in these 12 verses is that Jesus changes everything. We think about change that we go through. Somebody share with me a major life change. Divorce. Divorce. Yeah. Marriage. Marriage. <laughs> Having a child. Having a child. Somebody else. New job. Moving. New job. Moving. Death. 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 Termination. Coronary surgery. Losing a job. Coronary surgery. You've had to deal with two of those this summer, right, John? Hypothetically. I mean, in theory, we've read that coronary surgery may change a lot of things, right? <laughs> probably don't get us as, as nice of food anymore, probably limiting your, your red meat intake, not quite as much butter or salt, just, just a hunch. Change a lot of things. Somebody else? Kids going off to college. Kids going to college. I think I've got 11 years until that glorious day. <laughs> <laughs> I love my kids. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Somebody else. I'm closer. Yeah. Things that change, like major life changes, right? If, if you really think about it, life could be summarized by a series of changes, right? You, you go off to college. You graduate college. You graduate college. You get married. You maybe a buy a house. <laughs> you start that first job. Maybe a career change. Like you can think through, you could define your life by a series of changes if you really wanted to. Is, is it easy or difficult to change? It's hard. It's hard. Why, Kathy? Because you're in the groove. Um, things are going along smoothly. It requires effort. Right. And all of a sudden, there's a blip. And you have to adjust to a new norm. Yeah. So, and it's hard to adjust to a new norm. It's 
hard to adjust to a new norm. No, it's good. Let's get somebody else. Easy or difficult to change? Depends on how you look at things. But people are used to consistency. Yeah. You can't have an autopilot. Yeah, you can't go on autopilot. For, for me, the biggest change in my entire life, other than following Jesus, because that changed everything for my life, was getting married. Getting married is probably the biggest change in my life. Because, well, thank you. <laughs> I should be saying I'm sorry. Change mine too. I say that. If you know me well enough, you know that I need to apologize to my wife. I'm sorry. But getting married is a huge change. Having kids is a huge Changing careers, getting remarried is a huge change. Whatever that case is, yes, ma'am. Changing churches. Changing churches is a huge change. You're absolutely, absolutely. You know, we make choices. Sometimes we deal with the consequences of other people's choices, like our kids deal with the consequences of our choices, whether that's changing houses, changing churches, changing jobs, changing neighborhoods, maybe even changing states. But things change all the time. And some, some changes are big, some changes are small, some changes don't even get us phased, some changes derail us for months. But I want us to consider this morning that Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. The scripture for today, we're in Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12, and it's the start of the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher to ever live, King Jesus. This is a sermon that he preached. He went up on the mountain, he sat down, and he started preaching. Uh, he had been traveling, he had called some of the disciples already. He had been doing uh, healing ministry, uh, 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 helping the sick, healing the poor. Helping the poor, healing the sick, I got that backwards. <laughs> He had been teaching and preaching about the kingdom of heaven, and he gathered a really big crowd, and then seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain and sat down and gave us Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever lived, King Jesus. And the bottom line of this entire sermon, especially the 12 verses we're going to look at this morning, the bottom line of the entire sermon is that Jesus changes everything. If you meet Jesus face to face, your life will never be the same again. Because Jesus changes everything. under the, the heading of the Beatitudes. Like I said earlier, it's from the Latin word bliss, pointing us to, to the state of being blessed or happy or fortunate or, or blissful. The, the Greek word for blessed, we're going to hear the word blessed over and over and over again. Blessed are you, blessed is this, blessed is this, blessed is this. We're going to hear this word blessed over and over and over again. It's a p picture of contentment, of a permanent and unchanging contentment that's not based on a relationship, a job, a child, economic circumstances. It's an inward contentment that is greater than your circumstance, whether that's good or bad. It's an inward picture of contentment. And Jesus starts this section. He says, when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, that's a, a traditional um, um, type of teaching, first century Jewish life. The rabbi would have sat down to teach. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, the very first thing he says is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed, happy, content, fortunate are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This would have been incredibly countercultural. It still is incredibly countercultural, because what the world tells me is that blessed are the self-confident. Blessed are those who know they're awesome. Blessed are those who know or think they're better than everyone at everything. But Jesus changes everything, and he says, blessed are the poor 
in spirit. The world says, focus on you, find you, find whatever is true for you. Think happy thoughts. You're so great. You're so awesome. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We see the word kingdom all throughout the Gospels. It says, and Jesus began preaching about the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of Jesus. The rule and reign of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, the rule and reign of King Jesus. The kingdom of heaven doesn't, doesn't belong to the self-confident, but to those who are broken. I'm the chief of sinners. That's what Paul would write. A preacher was once asked, he was asked, who is the greatest sinner you've ever known? And he said, well, I am. Because I know myself better than anyone else. And I know the depth of my own sinfulness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The world says blessed are the self-confident. Jesus says blessed are the, self are the poor in spirit. Those who are so broken, those who are so shattered, that their only hope and confidence is Jesus. That there is no hope other than Jesus. This picture of poor, in, in, in America, we really don't understand what it means to be poor. Because our, the poorest of our poor are still far wealthier than the overwhelming majority of the world's population. Like, we have redefined words because our nation is so economically prosperous. Like, we think about disposable income. Anybody ever consider disposable income? The rest of the world operates on survivable income. Like, they generate whatever they can just to survive. We generate whatever we can to think about how we can live more comfortably. See, we don't fully understand the word poor in our country. Because even, even with no place to sleep, we can always find a place to eat. Like, no one in Bradenton, Florida needs to go hungry, ever. There are resources so that no one in our city ever has to go hungry. We don't fully understand what this word poor was. But here, in context, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's talking about someone that is entirely dependent on others. Like, zero, zero. They have absolutely nothing and are 100% dependent on someone else. That's how Jesus uses the word poor. That's the context that it would have meant in the first century setting. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are so broken spiritually that we are completely reliant on someone else. That there is nothing to depend on in and of ourselves. Not just a little dependent, but entirely hopeless apart from the help of Jesus. This changed everything because the religious elite in Jesus' day were proud. They wanted to show everyone how great they were. They wanted to show everyone how awesome they were, how perfectly they could follow the law of God and the tradition of man. And Jesus said, your pride is nonsense. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those that realize they're hopeless apart from the grace and mercy of God are those that will see, that will inherit, that will possess the kingdom of heaven. All of the rest of the Beatitudes, everything else, every point starts right here. Brokenness in our spirit. Complete poverty in our spirit before God. Everything, the rest of the sermon, the rest of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 starts at this one point. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus changes everything. He would go on, he said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The picture of mourning is the, the picture of that most gut-wrenching agony or grief it would have been used to describe the loss of a loved one. The agony and the grief that we experience that is very real when we lose someone we care deeply about. 
that's not the type, that's, that's, that's the type of emotion, but that's not the type of mourning Jesus has in mind here. He's talking about someone that, that sees their sinfulness as a violation of God's holiness and is mourning over their sinfulness. Because it starts with being broken before God, humble before God, poor in spirit before God. We, we realize that we are completely dependent on God because we are poor in spirit. And that leads us to mourning over our own sinfulness. When we maintain a high view of God and a high view of his righteousness, we will have a proper view of our own sinfulness as a violation against the holiness of God. In the Psalms, we didn't study this, this psalm this summer, but in the Psalms, there's Psalm 51 that gives us a, a blueprint for repentance. Psalm 51 is a psalm of David when he was approached with his own sinfulness by the prophet David had committed adultery. David had sent Bathsheba's husband to the front lines to be killed in war. And he lied about the whole thing, trying to cover the whole thing up. An adulterating, murdering liar. David is confronted with his sinfulness. And it led to a God-honoring mourning over his sinfulness. And a recognition that he had sinned against God. In Psalm 51, it says, against you, against you alone have I sinned. Realizing that his sinfulness was a violation of the holiness, against, uh, of, the holiness of God. Had he sinned against Bathsheba? Yes. Had he sinned against Uriah? Yes. Had he sinned against the entire nation of Israel because of how he led in his own sinful choices? Yes. But ultimately, his sinfulness was a violation of the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And it led him to a godly sorrow and mourning. When we have a, a posture of, of complete dependence on God, being poor in spirit, that should lead us to see our sinfulness for what it is. It's a violation of the holiness of God. And a mourning over sin, godly sorrow leads to repentance. And the beauty of the gospel is that repentance leads to forgiveness and cleansing. That's why Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. As sure as this is, we have 1 John 1, 1.9. It says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just. Faithfulness and justice. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. It says from all unrighteousness, not some unrighteousness, not just the little stuff, but you still have to pay a penance for the really bad things. 1 John 1, 9 says to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we mourn our sin, godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to forgiveness and cleansing, which is why we are comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The world says minimize and excuse. Jesus says mourn. The world says minimize and excuse your sin. You know, I just lost my cool today. I don't have an anger problem. I just lost my cool today. No, you're angry. You know, I don't have a truth-telling problem. I just sometimes lie. Well, you, because you're a liar. You know, I'm not a thief, but I do cheat a little bit on my taxes. Because you're a stealer, how far do we have to go? Comfort does not come from excusing and rationalizing sin, trying to minimize it. Comfort comes from mourning over sin and letting that mourning turn to sorrow and repentance and being forgiven completely. Comfort is knowing that the God of the universe knows how wretched of a man I am, but he also has paid the price in his justice on the cross and has forgiven me completely. That is comforting because I am the worst sinner I have ever known. Jesus changes everything, not some things, everything. Mourning leads to comfort and joy because of Jesus. 
the world says excuse and make make a rationalization try to minimize your sin Jesus says mourn over your sin as a violation of the holiness of God and you will be comforted here's another thing that I think the world says the world says love your own sin and mourn over the sin of others <laughs> right the world says love your own sin rationalize and enjoy your own sin point fingers at the sinfulness of others Jesus says, mourn your sin. For some of us, we need to stop loving our sin and start repenting of it. <coughs> Jesus changes everything. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Verse 5, he says, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. The world said, says, blessed are the proud and mighty, for they will dominate, whether it's on the football field or whether it's in business or whether it's whatever in the neighborhood community association at the pool. The world says, blessed are the proud and mighty. Jesus says, blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. This beatitude is a reference to Psalm 37, 11, where it says, but the humble will inherit the land. It has a similar ring to it, doesn't it? Depending on your English translation, mine says humble. Some say meek or gentle. They all have the same root word. Now what does it look like to display a Holy Spirit-empowered humility or meekness or gentleness? What does that look like? Does that mean you're a pushover? I don't think so. I mean, Moses was a pretty awesome guy, right? can't read the Old Testament and think Moses wasn't just one awesome guy. But the Bible says he was more humble and meek than any man on the, that walked the, world, walked the earth. See, meek has this picture of, of controlled power. Humility has this picture of controlled power. Gentleness has this picture of controlled power. What does it look like to display a Holy Spirit-empowered humility or, or meekness or gentleness? See, gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Paul says in Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Open confession for you this morning. I was studying this text very early one morning. This week it was dark out. The kids weren't up. Victoria was sleeping. You know, praying through, studying, reading, studying, reading, writing. Thinking, oh yeah, that's going to sound really good. That's going to sound really good. That really makes perfect sense. I think this goes together well. Reading, writing, studying. And then my kids woke up. <clears throat> and then my kids weren't focused on getting ready out the door and even though they have a list of things and a timeline to get out the door every morning in a very visible place in our home you can't miss it you can't miss the I don't know it's like a three by four uh, paper on the wall that says everything that has to do in the time it has to be done no one was focused on getting out the door and then Hurricane Paul just swept through our home Right, Lex? Yes. <laughs> then Hurricane Paul happened. Then I got stuck in traffic behind drivers in Bradenton that don't know how to drive. And Hurricane Paul happened. And then I got back in the car after dropping three of the four kids off at school, driving back to the house to finish my studying for the week. And Hurricane Paul happened as more Bradenton drivers didn't know how to drive. And then I turned my tablet on, finally get back into my study. And here's... Here's the opening sentence of the page that popped on as soon as I turned this tablet back on. It says, meekness is the way of the New Testament. And I realized how short of the Lord's standards I was falling. Meekness is the way of the Lord, of the New Testament. And I confessed and I repented and I turned from, from, 
my lack of gentleness. Meekness is a, is a quiet confidence in Christ in all and through all things. We know our place. We know our role. We know that he is Jesus. He is the king of the world. That he saves people. That we don't save anyone. That we're called to fully submit and surrender to his work in ways in the world. One commentator that I read this week, he says, Pride seeks its own glory, but meekness seeks the glory of God. Pride seeks its own glory, but meekness seeks the glory of God. Jesus changes everything. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the proud and mighty. He says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the humble. And next he says, as he changes everything, blessed are those who hunger and thirst righteousness for they will be filled blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness see I don't, I don't believe it's coincidental that Jesus talks about our most basic human needs the need for water and food to talk about how we should hunger and thirst for righteousness that we should pursue righteousness like we pursue food and drink to the starving and the de dehydrated, the desire for food or water would be all-consuming. Yesterday, I threw, uh, uh, I pitched at the softball fields for our 8U assessments. I threw probably 500 pitches in the heat total to 70 little girls, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old little girls, as they tried to swing their softball bats and assess for the fall season. I know what it's like to be consumed with getting something cold to drink. I think I, I drenched my shirt three or four times through the morning. And I was consumed with finding my drink in between players. Maybe mowing the yard. Maybe fasting over lunch or not even having time for lunch. We realize it's we ate breakfast at 6, and it's 6 o'clock in the evening, and we haven't stopped to eat anything else, and we all of a sudden are hungry, and all we can think about is food. Do we thirst and hunger for the righteousness of God like that? That's what Jesus is pointing us to. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The desire for the righteousness of Christ is to be all-consuming. For the Christian. And the promise is that we will be filled. It's a picture of being completely satisfied. There is nothing left that we would want to eat anymore because we have, we have experienced, we have been filled, completely satisfied with God's righteousness. And the beauty of the gospel is that while we have no righteous in our own, as we repent and believe and follow Jesus, we get his righteousness imputed to us. His righteousness is given to us through repentance and faith as we acknowledge that we are poor in spirit. We're mourning over our sin. We humble ourselves. We depend and rely on Christ. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We will be filled. As we repent and believe the gospel, trust in Jesus through faith and follow him, we are immediately declared righteous. We are set free to pursue his righteousness in and through all things because Jesus changes everything. The world said blessed are the self-righteous because they're always right. Jesus says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for my righteousness for they will be completely satisfied. Jesus changes everything. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. <coughs> the world says, blessed are the ruthless, for they will get theirs at all costs. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. See, this one really is, is circular. The, 
because the moment we believe the gospel, we turn from our sin, trust in Jesus through repentance and faith, and in that moment, we experience the mercy of God because he does not judge us for our sins. He gives us his righteousness. In that moment, we experience the mercy of God that propels us to be merciful to others, and in response, as we show mercy, God is exceedingly merciful with us. It's circular, and it's beautiful. Ephesians chapter 2, he, he, Paul talks about the riches of God's mercy that have been given to us in Jesus, the compassion of Jesus. All throughout the gospel, it shows that Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion and mercy go hand in hand. Genuine compassion expressed in genuine help. There's, that's the component of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The world says blessed are the ruthless. Jesus says blessed are the merciful. We see a need, we fill a need. Generously, compassionately. Because Jesus changes everything. Next he says blessed are the pure in heart. <coughs> when the world says your actions matter, Jesus says your motives matter. When the world says your actions matter, Jesus says your motives matter. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The picture here is that of a single-minded devotion to Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. back to that Psalm 51 example, that blueprint for repentance. David asked God to give him a clean heart. And the language is that give me a new heart. Replace my heart. Replace my heart that is stained and sinful with a new heart. Ezekiel would prophesy, the new, he would give the, the prophecy of the new covenant, and it would say that when God will remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, where his law would be written on our hearts, on the hearts of his people. See, purity in heart matters. Our devotion to Christ matters. Purity matters. Our motive matters. All of our motives matter. And Jesus would say later in Matthew that the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Our heart directs how we act. The world says your actions matter. Jesus says your heart, your motives matter. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, guard your heart above all else. For it is the source of life. How do we maintain a pure heart as a follower of Christ? See, I would say that a Christian with a pure heart is a Christian that is constantly living a life of confession and repentance before God. Constantly. Like, you don't need to confess to me, you need to bring it to the Lord. You don't need to repent to me, you need to bring it to Jesus. He says, he says, Christian, uh, one that is pure in heart, must be, must be a Christian that is living a life of constant confession and repentance of sin. The world says your actions alone matter. Jesus says, no, I'm concerned with your motives. Because Jesus changes everything. Next he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. You think there's a difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping? I think so. What do we think of when we, when we say peacekeeping? Status quo. Status quo? Anybody else? What do you think of when you think of peacekeeping? Don't you miss the Grabowski song? I do. <laughs> Jeez. I, I do. I'm controlling myself. I can count on you and our audience participation portion of our sermon. I know I can always count Sometimes on you. Sometimes inappropriately, but you can always count on you. I'm not worried about it. Cool. I'm not worried about it. Because I know your heart. I know your motives. What do you, what do you think the difference is between peacemaking and peacekeeping? One is, one is, one is mellow and the other one is threatening. 
do? Like law enforcement. Law one is preventative, <laughs> one is active. Yeah. See, when I think of peacekeeping, I think of holiday meals, <laughs> family <laughs> gatherings. <laughs> Whether it's by my side of the family, Victoria's side of the family, I don't really care. When I think of peacekeeping, I think of, all right, we know that there are these issues that are percolating just beneath the surface. Both sides, my side of the family, Victoria, I mean, all families are like this. It's not just the health of the family. It's all families are like this. We're laughing because we can relate, right, Bob? I mean, it's funny. Like, we think about, peace, we think about peacekeeping. We know that there are various issues percolating just under the surface, and we know that if we can make it like 36 hours until everybody goes home, maybe only six hours until everybody goes home if your family's local, but we know that if we can just balance the schedule, keep these issues pushed down just below the surface, we will be able to keep the peace, right? Yep. We want to have Thanksgiving dinner and keep the peace. But peacemaking making I think is a, is a game changer. See when the world says just whatever you do just keep the peace keep everybody smiling this facade of peacefulness the Sunday morning fine the holiday fine whatever it is Jesus says blessed are the peace makers and see I don't I don't think it's just an absence of conflict but it's a pursuit of righteousness and truth because there is no peace, as Jesus uses the word peace, apart from righteousness and truth. You cannot separate peace, righteousness, and truth. You may be able to have a, a, a quiet holiday meal separated from righteousness and truth, but you cannot have peace apart from righteousness and truth. And we don't pursue peace at the expense of righteousness and truth. We pursue peace that is thoroughly rooted in righteousness and truth, which may mean sometimes we have to speak the truth in love. Pointing people to the glory of God in Christ. The greatness of Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, there's this this section in Romans chapter 12 where some translations will have like a section header. You know in your Bibles how it has like paragraph descriptors or whatever. That's not actually part of the original text. It's just helpful when we're studying it. And some English translations have this section of labeled living like a Christian. Living like a Christian. My translation says Christian ethics. And in Romans chapter 12 verse 18 under the heading of living like a Christian or Christian ethics, he says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Knowing that there are two sides and knowing that peace may not always be possible, Paul says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then later, Romans chapter 14, under the heading, The Law of Love. See, I love these headings. I mean, they're, they're, they're great descriptors. Under the heading of the Law of Love, he says, So then let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Let us pursue what promotes peace and builds up one another. See, none of us are called to be peacekeepers. We're called to be peacemakers, which may be. We have hard conversations with people from a posture of love, all building on being poor in spirit, mourning over our own sinfulness, being a humble, meek, gentle, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, being merciful, being pure in heart, and then being a peacemaker. Because Jesus changes everything. The world says, keep the peace so we can have a peaceful, conflict-free holiday meal, Jesus says make peace based on truth and righteousness and mercy and mercy recognizing your own brokenness before God. And he said they will be called sons of God. What an incredible promise. See these are these are proclamations here. 
These are proclamations. So blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. That is a proclamation, not, not like a maybe. I mean, that's a guarantee. As we allow the Spirit of Christ to dwell in us, to lead us to be a peacemaker, we will be called a son of God. Lastly, as Jesus changes everything, he says, blessed are the persecuted. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Three verses, this last blessing. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. See, there's a difference between being persecuted for doing something stupid and per being persecuted for righteousness. We need to know the difference. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. That's Jesus saying, because of me, when they lie and say evil things against you because of Jesus, then he says, be glad and rejoice. Be like super happy and joyful because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We need to be really careful. We're not blessed when we are persecuted for doing something stupid. We are blessed when we are persecuted for standing for righteousness, for standing for Jesus, for living for Jesus, for allowing ourselves to be poor in spirit, mourning over our sin, humble before the Lord and before others, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, being merciful, pure in heart, peacemaking, we will be persecuted. I mean, there's a promise, like everyone that lives for Jesus at some level will experience some type of persecution, period. Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. Your testimony of the persecuted church. In places where you can be sentenced to death for living for Jesus, for claiming to be a Christian. And it's interesting, I have yet to hear a testimony from the persecuted church where they said, would you please pray for us that God would ease our persecution? They always pray. They always ask, would you please pray for us that we would remain faithful to the very end? Because they have experienced the blessing of God, the blissfulness, the joyful contentment, that inward peace of knowing Jesus and no amount of persecution can ever separate them from being blessed, being blissful, being content in Christ inwardly. Jesus changes everything. The world says, blessed are the prosperous. Jesus says, blessed are the persecuted. But the kingdom of heaven is theirs. See, friends, Jesus changes everything. And that's the only way I know to summarize these 12 verses, that Jesus changes everything. He turns the whole thing upside down. And the question for each of us is, where does he need to change you? Where does he need to change you? I know where he needs to change me. I know it. I know it. It is impossible to live the Beatitudes apart from finding your life in Christ. Apart from finding life in Jesus. You can't just be broken, mourning, humble hungering and thirsting for right. You can't live this out apart from having life in Christ. Through repentance and faith, we turn from our sin and turn to Jesus. We believe that he is who the Bible says he is, that he lived a perfect life, that life that we could not live, that he died the death we deserve to die, that he defeated the enemy, death, sin, and death. The third day, he walked out of the tomb. He was alive, and he offers life to all who would follow him. We can't live this. We can't live this apart from him giving us life, apart from him giving us new life. Because if we try to do this in our own strength, we will always fail. Even if our actions fail, remember, Jesus is more concerned with your motives than your actions because he knows that your, your motives fuel your actions. Even if our actions were knocking it out of the park, we're going to fail on our motives. We will fail if we try to do this apart from life in him. Jesus changes everything. Where does he need to change you?
for some it may be that initial point of belief, of turning from our sin. We're headed one way. It's the picture of a U-turn headed one way and turning the other. We're heading, chasing long and hard after our own sinfulness. It's turning away from that and running toward Jesus through repentance and faith. For some, it's that initial point that we need to be changed by the gospel, by the glory of Jesus in our own lives through repentance and faith. For others, just like me, by God's grace, we need to have a very inactive hurricane season in our house this year. Because when fall is tired, hurricane fall comes out. Every one of us has an area in our life where we need to change. Would you let Jesus change you? Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Thank you so much for the gift of your grace. God, thank you that when we fail, you forgive. God, thank you when